Good afternoon. Um, all right, so uh, I guess I have about 30 minutes or so. And um, at, at Google, I think we're, we, we look at things maybe a little bit different, as you, as you might be aware. Um, so we're going to talk about things that perhaps you haven't been talking about uh, in the context of the day. So let me, let me start with this sort of this thesis, which is kind of common sense. Um, good information changes lives. We fundamentally believe that. Let me start with a story uh, of a gentleman by the name of, of Mark Lessig. Mark Lessig is uh, in, in Australia, and he's a gentleman who um, is the director of dynamic welding and engineering. Uh, about 12 years ago, uh, he unfortunately lost his right arm in an auto accident. Uh, he had lost the, the arm you know, so high up near the point of the, the shoulder that a uh, common prosthetic was just really not suitable uh, for him at the time. So he went through a few things. First, uh, he decided to adopt a, uh, a cosmetic prosthetic, which, uh, not my words, you can go research his words, he, he, he nicknamed Dudley, uh, because it was a near useless dud for all intents and purposes. Um, and then, after that, he decided to take a look at a bit more expensive advanced prosthetic uh, from Germany. Well, while better, it posed some additional challenges for him, uh, namely, uh, in the type of work, the, the machinist type of work that he does, it wasn't terribly durable. So when, uh, so when he struggled uh, with that, or when it broke, or when it, because it wasn't durable, he had to constantly send it back to Germany, and this, this caused, caused some challenges, of course. But he was determined to figure out a way to solve his challenge, a way to find a personalized solution, get to a better outcome. So he started researching, and he started researching, and he ultimately came across in this old display case uh, this Carnes artificial arm, which was actually patented in 1904. Uh, and being uh, an engineering type, he looked at it and realized it was actually quite advanced for, uh, for the time, uh, certainly for, for 1904. So he was determined to take a deeper look at it. He went online, did a bunch of research, was actually able to find the patents, was able to do uh, a patent search, was able to find the blueprints, find the designs. And lo and behold, what he ended up doing was he, he ended up finding one. Hadn't been used in 60 years. It was built in 1920, and he was able to order and actually receive this. He further went on eBay and was able to find two more and actually order those as well. And then set out to do something that I find truly remarkable. He wanted to reverse engineer the arm to make it work for himself. And he did. Amazingly, he, he, actually, uh, he actually did this. He was able to reverse engineer the arm. He was also able to uh, improve the arm. So he was able to take care of issues like the durability of the arm for the machinist type of work that he was, uh, he was doing. He was able to al also uh, ensure that was controlled by natural body movement. So therefore, it was a, um, a lot more reliable. So he continues to improve this arm, but what's the thing, you know, so in and of itself, that's incredible. But what's really amazing to me is, after all that, what does he really want to do? He wants to share it. He wants to share the design. He wants to share the arm. He wants to share it with those who are, who are actually, uh, who actually are in need. And I think this is a real testament to kind of where we are today from a technology perspective, but I think it's really a testament to him. I don't want to take anything away from him for not only the ability to find good information, turn that information into knowledge, but actually derive a very personalized solution for himself and then ultimately share it for the world. So if the hypothesis is that good information changes lives, and that certainly is one case, it's important to keep in mind right now that nearly four billion people in the world don't have access to the internet, right? At Google, we think about the internet a little bit. Um, and therefore, they are a bit limited, certainly, in the information that they, have, uh, that they have access to. But that's changing, and that's changing very rapidly. So by most estimates, go ask most people, by 2020, five years from now, the expectation is the vast majority of people on Earth will be connected to the internet. More amazingly is within that five-year period, you know, pick your estimate, but some estimates put the number of devices actually connected to the internet at about 200 billion. 200 billion is a hard number to wrap your head around. So if you do the math on that, that's about 25 devices per person on Earth. Right, we'll come back to what devices might actually mean, uh, uh, mean there in a minute. So access is accelerating. 
access to find good information is accelerating. And what I wanted to start with was paying for you kind of a time horizon in which that's accelerating. Five years or less, right? Five years or less to get the world connected. And then there's a whole bunch of interesting things, uh, interesting things that can be done. So my goal today is to really talk to you, given this increased access and where it's going, three relationships in all of your lives, my life, all of our lives, three relationships that are fundamentally changing. They've already changed, but they're gonna change even more over the next few years. One is our relationship with computers. Second is our relationship with information. And third, interestingly, is our relationship with the physical real world services we choose to consume and, pro and, and provide. So we'll dive into a little bit more detail around that. As, as Dan uh, noted, uh, my name's Umesh Vermeer. I'm here with Manoj, who's somewhere, and Robert Rice. There's Manoj in the back. Robert's over there. Um, from Google, and we spend every day talking to very, very large organizations, public sector, private sector, who have significant challenges wondering, what do I do with the, the, the young workforce that's really coming in? How do I deal with all this legacy data that I have? What about all these aging systems? Uh, and they have all these challenges that exist. And in the end, they kind of ask us this very simple question. And I say that tongue in cheek, right? How do we transform? Okay, sort of transform what? Um, and how do we reinvent? I think understanding these three points, our changing relationship with the three things I'm going to talk about, is absolutely critical to understanding how to really start that process. Um, so let me jump in by first starting with our changing relationship with technology. So in order for us to understand our changing relationship with technology, we need to look back just a little bit at time. When we think about the evolution of the computer or the evolution of technology, we think of it as a very linear thing. Let's see, I got some chairs here. We have like mainframes, kind of, you know, this size, maybe a little bit larger, going on to desktops, to laptops, tablets, phones, where we are today. And I think people often misinterpret the next form factor as the next evolution of computing. So we get this all the time. Hey, there's Google Glass. Is that where computers are going? Hey, there's Watches, is that where computing's going? I think we have to very, very quickly wrap our head around the idea that computing is no longer something we sit at or something that we actually hold. That reality is coming very, very quickly. Rather, I want you to think about it as capacity. Capacity in everyday items. Capacity in those chairs, right? Capacity in the cameras back there. Capacity in things that don't have screens. Right? This is a very, very different perspective on where computing, uh, computing is actually going. When we start to think about it that way, we think about cars, we think about TVs, uh, and we think about the far less exciting, light bulbs. I'm gonna talk about light bulbs for a second. I'm gonna assume everyone has light bulbs in their, their house, so this is a fairly universal topic here. Um, it's really not that difficult to connect a light bulb get a connected light bulb to connect it to the internet. It's really not that difficult of a, of a thing to do. And there's many, many, many out there that are on the market from many device manufacturers. But think of the following scenario. Assume you have over 50 light bulbs in your house and you are replacing those and you are replacing those with connected light bulbs from three or four or five different device manufacturers. How many people here, now let's be honest, let's put our hands up, how many people here are gonna go to five different applications on their phone to control five different sets of light bulbs from five different manufacturers? Yeah, I see a lot of people nodding no, right? I, I, I certainly wouldn't do that, it's, and it's nothing against, it's nothing against the, the light bulb, right? It's important to understand that where we are relative to devices is where we were with smartphones kind of in the early days. It's very, very, very hard for device manufacturers to sort of figure out what to build to right now other than to connect us to the internet. And it's hard to understand the user experiences that really, really, really matter. So right now, our relationship with technology is a little bit gated in this sense over the next few years because of the potential pitfalls of this user experience. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but this, this, what can be a very difficult user experience. We've been talking a lot about interoperability today here. At the end of the day, user experience is what this is about, right? We, we want there to be this very, very, very positive user experience very, very positive user experience. So, so with that, there are three things that are really gonna happen over the coming weeks, months, and years that are going to change this and fundamentally change our relationship with technology. And Google, we're working very, very hard on a number of these. One, 
As I talk about devices and compute simply being capacity in a, an everyday device, clothes, chairs, whatever the case may be, one, it's standardizing how compute actually operates the spec inside of these devices. Two, it's standardizing how these devices can communicate with each other. And three, it's simplifying, and I intentionally use that word, simplifying the user experience for how we configure, use, and, and, and manage these. We're just at the very beginning of that. Right? Today, everything is largely a tether off of our phone, in our personal lives, in, in the workplace. We have technology that's a bit more antiquated um, at times. But we're just at the beginning of that, and fundamentally, as this evolves, our relationship with technology is going to change dramatically over the, over the next few years. So if we assume that, we assume that the relationship is going to continue to change, and we assume there's going to be more and more and more devices that come on. That come on. Let's go back to the story of Mark Lessig. We assume there's going to be the availability of better information. I shouldn't say better, of more information. More information is not necessarily good. Right? Are we all kind of in agree agreement with that? Right? Who has too much information right now kind of in, in, in their lives? Yeah, I, I think most of us do. Um, I'm going to use this story, uh, an example very quickly that everyone can relate to uh, of, of, of my wife. And this is the state as we as technologists, as we look at this, how we sort of see the world, despite how far we've come. So my wife is part of a, uh, of a book club. They meet once a month. Uh, to discuss uh, a book at a particular, you know, re restaurant around town. Uh, and, it, and the restaurant changes. So imagine she's on her device and she gets a text from someone that says, hey, are you going to make it to book club this week? Sent you the details in an email. Let's walk the sequence of what needs to happen as a user, right? You talk about some interesting interoperability challenges. You have to exit your chat application, go into your email, figure out where that email is, figure out what the day, time, and place restaurant is for that, exit your email, go look at your calendar, figure out if you're busy at that time of day, potentially go back to your email, get that information out of your email. If you don't know where it is, stick it in the mapping application, figure out what the driving directions to, to that are. Does that seem awfully complicated to anyone? I mean, if you're and, oh, you know, and if you don't have your device near you, well then, you know, I guess, well, I don't know, maybe that makes it simpler, I, I, I don't know. Um, and, and so, what needs to happen, right? That's just a very simple example. How much does that happen at work every single day? How many different applications do we go into? How many different systems do we go into? So what needs to happen to fundamentally change that? Three things. Three things that need to happen to change our relationship with information. Context. Context. So in the case of my wife, we theoretically could already know where she is, little thing like GPS, right, in the phone, what time of day it is, what time the actual meeting is at, who is sending the text. There's a lot of information we already know. If a text comes across and it actually has the words in it, meeting, email, details, there's some signals there that probably the answers to the first set of questions are in email somewhere. So context is very, very important. And this is already being addressed in many, many ways. When I leave here today, I know on my phone, by the time I get to my car, there will be a map. That map will have directions to the next place I'm going, and it will have reminders for me all ready for where I need to stop before, before I actually uh, get to my next destination. Because it knows I'm here. It knows what time it is. Context. So that's very, very, very important. The second thing that we want that, that's very important is proactively providing answers to people in that context. And if you were here last year, I talked, talked a little bit about that. But there's no reason, in the case of my wife, this is actually available today, there's no reason that we can't, in that same text window, provide her with the ability to say, the answer to the secondary questions you have is 7 p.m. on Saturday at P.F. Chang's, just respond. Yes, no, or maybe. And ultimately, the third thing is we need to allow people to take action. We need to allow them to take action in that context very, very directly. The yes, no, or maybe. So context, the ability to proactively provide answers, and then ultimately uh, take, uh, take action. And this is happening uh, already today, right? This is already, uh, uh, this is already available, and there are literally hundreds of millions of people who are already using these capabilities. Now, I ask you a question. Do they think of this as interoperability? 
I would argue probably not. They just think of it as capacity. They think of it, it as something that they have. They haven't thought about the back-end integration work that actually has to, has to be done. So fundamentally, our relationship with information, uh, our relationship, give it a second. Fundamentally, our, our relationship with information is changing. Now, the scenario I painted for my wife, does that apply only to our private lives? What do we think? No, right? A absolutely not, right? From, from our perspective, it applies to everything. Think of the words knowledge worker. What's a knowledge worker doing every single day at work? They're seeking out information, asking a bunch of questions, and ultimately looking to give an answer to someone. So we continue to invest very, very significantly in something we call the knowledge graph, which is our representation, Google's representation, of the world and everything in it, and the relationships between all of those things. And the intent behind that is to be able to answer these very, very direct questions that people have and proactively surface that information uh, to a user uh, ahead of when, when, they, when they need it. So I'm going to quickly jump to then the third piece. If the access is coming, and we'll be there over the next few years, the compute is coming, and we shift our thinking on compute over the next few years, if information at large scale, certainly on the consumer side, is coming, what are people doing with this? Right? W what is actually happening that might look, look a little bit different? So a couple of questions for the group here. First question, who in the last week has posted something and shared something online? Twitter, Facebook, Google+, pick your favorite. Okay, I would expect the majority of the room. Who here in the room in the last week has gone beyond that and extended that online behavior to share something physical? Meaning, you shared your housing, you shared your car, you shared your appliances, you shared something in your physical world. Who here has done that in the last week? Few people, good for you. That's awesome. Um, that's always been sort of the contrast, and quickly what I quickly what I want to talk about. So I would expect the hands to go down significantly for the the the, the second question, right? Sharing online, sharing in the real world, same or different? What do we think? Different. My impression, my opinion, is that as a technologist, is we think of the first one as communication. We think of it very significantly as communicating with people. We think of the second one as almost a transaction, distributing goods to people, and we have different value systems. But what happens fundamentally, and this is what I think is really happening today, what happens when those two actually collide, when they come together? When our online behavior for collaboration and sharing enabled by the internet and compute and all those things I talked about, actually is now reflected in our sharing of physical services and physical goods. Is this happening today? Sort of. What does Airbnb provide? Everyone, who's heard of Airbnb? Right, housing. What does Uber provide? Lyft provide, right? And there's some ones you probably haven't heard of, and you know, I, I see them every once in a while. If I want to deliver a package to the other side of the world, there's a whole marketplace I can go into and find someone who's getting on a plane to go to that side of the world and hand them my package and pay them for it, right? Gardens, housing, cars, you know, transportation, obviously, fitness classes, gyms. This is happening everywhere today because of access, because of compute, and because of personalized information that can be made available. What about healthcare? Is this happening today? Hmm? <laughs> I heard a specif specifically government healthcare. That's a nice qualifier um, that, that you've added on there. Um, it is, all right? It, it, it is. You know, what about on, you know, on, uh, being able to connect patients and on call doctors? that are in close proximity 24 by 7 to increase patient care in the home. It's happening. Shared on-demand medical transport. Happening. Right? Crowdsourced patient data. Happening. The amazing thing is all of those are happening, whether we put the qualifier on it or not, got, got the point, all of those things are happening today 
And they're happening largely through companies who are less than three years old. Right? So I want you to think about three years ago in time, and many of these, many of these companies didn't exist. Now let's fast forward three years, okay? So would it surprise you if we said, based on the way you sort of count, that Airbnb in the next one to two years will have more properties and book more hotel rooms than the world's large, largest, uh, largest hotel chain? Would it surprise you that Uber and Lyft have more drivers in New York City today than conventional, conventional taxi cabs? So what happens when our online sharing behavior starts to get reflected in the real world? Because that's the shift that that access, compute, and personalized information is now enabling. And we're just, and we're, we're, we're just at the beginning of that. But it's not all rosy. There are challenges associated with it, and I think the folks in this room are going to be the ones, here's the, here's the, the bad news story, right in the line of fire of dealing with those challenges, right? So what are the big challenges as that access is available, as uh, compute is available, as information on demand is available that's highly personalized, and we see these types of businesses operating? Well, let's look at them in three contexts. Was any of our regulations set up to support this? No. Regulation never really considered someone who could be a provider and a consumer at the same time. It's really a bit of a tricky world. Uh, I could be the provider as a large corporation to all of you as individuals that are consumers. So that's one area that you've read in the press that all these, all these companies and, and kind of as we look at these online and offline sharing behaviors, things that we're dealing with. What about companies? What about companies who have an online presence but now their workforce is largely dependent on a collection of individuals that may or may not be employees of the company? That's, that, that's a bit of a challenge. And what about assets? Assets is the one we also think about. What about shared assets? Private assets, or pu private assets used for public use. These are the big challenges that surround, surround this. And the picture I want to paint for you, for you to walk away with today, is on one side we have technology that's moving very, very, very rapidly. The rest of the four billion coming online. Uh, governments uh, looking at access, compute, information on demand. On the other side, we have regulation. We have company structure. We have shared assets. And in the middle of that is a whole bunch of decisions that are going to need to be made. And I believe it's folks like this in the room that are ultimately going to make those types of decisions. Um, all of us, my, my, myself included. And we can choose to shape, shape those decisions, shape the direction that this economy actually goes with, 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 with respect to that. So with that, what I really want to kind of you to walk away from this is, is access. Think about that in the context of the next five years, what's really coming. Compute, the shift from something we actually sit at or hold to something that's ubiquitous and all around which is gonna raise the amount of information that's fundamentally available for us. And we need a mechanism to be able to personalize that information and deliver it to people on demand, wading through all the noise that's actually there. On top of that, the startup community, small businesses, individuals, there's a vibrant, vibrant community that's there today to build solutions on, on top of that, whether it be crowdsourced data or otherwise, to build solutions on top of that and the next big ones don't even exist yet. That's the world of the next few years. Those are the challenges, certainly at Google, that, that we're looking at. And that's where we are working with organizations uh, every single day uh, to, to help address and understand the steps to move, uh, to move in that direction. Um, so with that, I'm gonna take some questions. If there are, you asked a bunch last year, I liked it. Let's do this. <laughs> 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 Hi, I'm Ivan Handler. I'm now independent. I used to be um, with the state of Illinois. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, fascinating, fascinating. Um, here's another question that just occurred to me, um, which is, so one of the major problems that we all, I think, understand is the problem in getting uh, regulation caught up to the reality we live in. Yeah. So my next question is obviously, 
what do we do with this tech? How do we use this technology to help us get the regulations that we need to support it? Is there some way that that can be, have you thought about that? Because that's going to be um, a major bandwidth um, modifier if, if we don't get laws changed you know, appropriately and much faster than they're used to changing. Yeah, and obviously I, I don't have the silver bullet, but I'm gonna, I'll provide you know, one perspective on that for you, right? Um, and the perspective is prototypes really matter, in my view. It, it is very different when we talk about the solution to a problem when someone fundamentally sees the possibility of the solution to a problem. So I'm assuming most people here have heard of the, the driverless car, the Google autonomous vehicle. It probably wouldn't have been ter terribly useful to, for Google to sit back and try to get all the laws changed before setting out to build the prototype. Does everyone sort of generally agree with that, that, that concept? Um, and that, uh, particularly having worked in government programs for a long time, there is a challenge. There's a challenge with the way the budgeting actually works to actually allocate for the programs that need to run to build the systems that actually need to deliver the solutions uh, for an end user. It's actually exactly right. the opposite is, is kind of what we're talking about. The ability to prototype very, very, very quickly at the beginning Right? Knowing full well, right, it's not a production system, but knowing full well you may run into this regulatory challenge that you're talking about, but it's a fundamentally different discussion when the prototype is there and, and is delivering some level of value versus the discussion about it. So that's, I don't know if that's particularly insightful, but <laughs> that's my, my two cents. Yes? What's that? Who pays for the prototype? Well, who has the most pain? That's usually who it is. Right, that's it, and that's, that was a very optimistic way of saying the same thing I just said. <laughs> right, <laughs> um, but, but that's right. And, and, and here's the other one, and, and I wanna say this with all, you know, with, with all, modesty. Um, sometimes, and it's not directly related to sort of the pay piece, right, but it's, yes, it's who has the most benefit, but it's also sometimes putting it out there to see what people will do with it. We can't always assume, if we're building a prototype, that we know exactly how it's fundamentally going to be used or the, 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 actual, the actual or the derived value that it's going to provide. It's actually um, sort of taking the next step. And you know, honestly, at, 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 uh, at Google, it's one of the things that I think you know, we sort of talk about it through the mantra of failing fast, but let's step away from that speak for a moment. It, it's really this idea that more often than not, a large percentage of more often than not, we are building systems in the image of the last system that we actually had for a lot of money that give us a marginal improvement on the capability we actually had. And we wonder why we're frustrated at the end of that cycle. And it very well could be obsolete by, by the time it's finished. And sometimes the hardest thing in the world to do is to look at the image of that existing system and the capability it has and recognize we're gonna do something very different than that. Because you, you will probably be over on the island here by yourself. Right, because it's just not naturally the way the way things work. But that's um, so. In that case, to come back to your question, that that that's a more tough one. Sometimes the funding for these things has to come from non-traditional places that are willing to support a group that's sort of looking this way at the problem, vice vice the other. One in the back there. To that point, Google was part of one of the Department of Defense uh, proposals for the department for their new EHR system mm -hmm. that was um, uh, uh, dismissed. Um, your proposal, I should say, Google and uh, and other right. uh, vendors. So, what would you say to that? And 
why weren't you part of that discussion? Because your point is absolutely spot on for that. Um, so, so I think uh, what I would really say to that um, is really more, it's probably less about that particular procurement and more just generally about the process uh, that I've observed. Um, and, I, and I'll just be very direct, and I don't think it's just, I don't think it's just Google. I think companies that are coming from large-scale commercial technology uh, who haven't been, uh, who have very, very large commercial adoption or consumer adoption, when we come into the government space, bluntly, and there is a set of requirements that is very, very strict, that represents in some way a very, very, very you know, finite set of requirements, it can often be a challenge for, I don't want to speak for other companies, but for Google and for others who are innovating at a pace where sometimes we're looking at the requirements and, and understanding, can we actually satisfy that requirement? Can we not satisfy that requirement? So in that case, my, where, you know, so if that's where not just we, but where I think large uh, 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 companies uh, struggle, companies like, like Google and others, really what we look at is we look at it through the lens of kind of objectives, right? And we find that we live a little bit better in a world when we're working with government programs in objectives that the government wants to meet over a six month, 12 month, 18 month which, uh, uh, cycle, which will allow our technology to evolve at the pace it's regularly evolving at and not be constrained by any other requirements that are coming in. Uh, and we can still meet the objectives of, of the government. And I, you know, and I don't know in the case of that particular, that's not a comment on that particular procurement, but it's this idea of objectives versus firm requirements. Um, that's a cycle that I think is, is very much a challenge for a lot of technology companies. Hopefully that answered your. We work in healthcare. We, we like to say um, that our technology is 30 years behind, you know, general industry in healthcare, and that's not always true. But the reality is, is and even speaking to the last comment, is that there are certain technical expectations that we have in this industry, whether it's government or whether it's large integrated delivery networks, mm -hmm. um, certain familiarity with technology, and yet technology is changing at such a rapid pace. Um, at a policy level, the government's trying to set standards to, to drive a direction of, of, of innovation, and yet what we're starting to see, and I, I work at a technology company, yeah. I operate in a health information exchange, we're seeing the technology is going way faster than these standards conversations are. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing concepts of non-SQL data processing systems really come into play. How, how would you, if you, had, if you had an opportunity to sit with the National Coordinator for Health IT today, what would you say to them about the policies that they should put forth to spear innovation in this space? Yeah, great question. Um, so th the first thing that I would look at, I mean, the, the first very tactical challenge, and then I'll kind of back out from that, is I would argue the pace at which policy is being written, it, that can't be sustained. Right, very simply, right? It doesn't matter what's in the policy, right? It, it simply can't, because of exactly what you said. Um, I was with a, a large, large, um, a large commercial company not too long ago that, that, that I won't mention, and, and I'll, I'll come back to that, but it, it illustrates the point. And they just have this massive IT portfolio, and, and, and they have regulation and so forth, and there's about 70 people sitting in the room, and the vast majority of them are just kind of peppering me with questions around, integration and interface standards and you know technical interface documents and descriptions and at an engineering level that stuff is important there is no doubt that that uh, is important well there's this one gentleman who's kind of over off to the side and he kind of said I'm, I'm confused is it not true that the average application lasts between six and 18 months today so why are we going to spend 18 months writing technical requirements and technical policy documents to manage an application that should be, rightfully so, end of life, probably within 18 months, right? And when I say end of life, improved, substantially changed, continuing to meet, um, uh, meet what the user there. So going back to your question, my first question would be, how long do you, if you were to build today, how long do you expect those applications to actually last? How long are they going to serve your users in the state that you build them today? And there's a commensurate amount of time you should spend actually designing for that, intentionally designing for that, 
right? Um, because I think once people kind of come to that sort of realization, the conversation shifts. At an engineering level, and I'm an engineer, don't get me wrong, we need schemas, we need interface documents, we need technical spec, we need all that. But at the policy level, what we're really talking about is that conversation changes to objectives. It really changes back to six month, 12 month, 18 month, or whatever your time frame is, objectives and articulating the objectives of what service you want that application to provide at that point in time or that policy to provide at that point in time. And then everything underneath it, the one thing you can guarantee is gonna change. It's gonna change from day to day. It's gonna change from day to day. And, and, and that's, that to me would be, tr if your question was what would I say, I would try to convince them of that, of that fact. Yes, sir. Healthcare is not an application. Right. <clears throat> and um, so, as a reason, and I hear what you're saying, but with healthcare, what's happening is we're gathering more and more data. And it's not useful if the data can't interoperate. In fact, it can be harmful. So, I'm wondering maybe what we need to do, is, at least in healthcare and human services, stop thinking about applications. I mean, that's a separate. Thing and start thinking about how do we start building a data layer that's going to be long-lived and that will also accept more and more data, genomics, all kinds of things are coming in. It needs to be absorbed, but at the policy level, most people don't care what the definitions are as long as right. they can use it. I think the problem we're having with the lack of governance is people at the policy level are getting enmeshed in technical discussions they don't right. understand, and people of us at the technical level are getting absorbed or thrown out of policy discussions, and you know, I mean, that, at least that's yeah, what I think and, is one of the problems. And, and, and to clarify, yeah, I, when I say application, I'm talking about simply the, the mechanism for how the information is delivered, right? System, application, right? It's, it's not being uh, overly specified. What you just said, though, I think is, is, right, is exactly right. If, there, there's no doubt that uh, a level of standards, right? We at Google, we have a significant number of standards in the way that we build our, our, our system today. Standards are absolutely needed. But when we sit down to do the next project, right, and I, I'm gonna give you a quick example because I think this will illustrate it, right? So has anyone ever heard of Project Loon from Google by chance? Project Loon, we're sending balloons up into the stratosphere, creating an aerial network to provide internet connectivity, different places, you know, very technical description there. Um, uh, right? When, when you go through something like that, right, the discussion is focused on what is the outcome that we want, right? And the outcome that we want is in rural areas and different parts of the world, we want 3G-like internet speeds for those users. There's a number of technical ways to try to get there. But you're exactly right. What I find often happens, um, whether it's health or, or in many programs, right, when we take kind of this programmatic approach, is we get really fixated on the implementation and the details of the implementation. We can lose the, the objective of what is the six month, what is the 12 month, what is the 18 month, what are we actually measuring against in that. So yeah, so don't, uh, don't take applications as a physical you know, application on my phone. It's really what's the delivery mechanism for the information a user ultimately needs. So. Um, all right, well, thank you very much.